Sign up at the end of this review to get my personal gear list. Steve, <laughs> Steve grab the, the mandolin back out of his hand, threw it in the case, grabbed the brochure, and fled. And we did eventually get a cease and desist letter. Hey there, Tony Policastro here from The Acoustic Letter, and today we have with us Ren Ferguson, formerly of Gibson Guitars, currently of Guild Guitars, and it's just a beautiful fall day in, in Bozeman, Montana, and we're going to chat some guitars. So, so welcome, Ren. Thank you. Um, Great thank to be you here. for being here. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your schedule. I know it's, it's been a busy probably a couple months for you. And um, I'm glad you're here today because there's a lot of questions in the air. And one of the first questions, which I find the most interesting, is your relationship with Gibson, how you got into Gibson, and what the story is of Gibson actually being here. When I first moved out here, I moved out here to work for Weber Mandolins, and I worked for Bruce Weber, who was also formerly of Gibson. So there's this interesting history of Gibson around here. Could you shed a little bit of light uh, about that? Sure. Um at the very beginning, um, I had uh, moved to Montana in 78, and I was living over in Big Timber. Mm -hmm. And I'd stopped into uh, the picking parlor when it was upstairs, and Steve Carlson uh, was sitting behind the counter playing a banjo, and I took a business card, an old one from my place in Venice Beach, and I laid it on the thing, and I said, gee, I do custom work and inlay, and if you're interested, uh, Maybe he'd give me a call. I live over in Big Timber, and he looked at the card, and he said, "Nope." Slid it back across the desk, <laughs> and went back to playing. And I stood around for a while, and he doesn't remember the story the same way I do. <laughs> at any rate, Steve uh, Carlson and I uh, became good friends, mm -hmm. and he uh, eventually, and that was early. That was uh, seventy-nine, okay. or six, yeah, seventy-nine, eighty, and he eventually purchased uh, from Chuck. Flat iron mandolin. Okay. And uh, some time went by, and I was building guns over in Big Timber. And I have had a lot of children. I was still having them over there. Uh -huh. I even had them over here. But um, <laughs> during that, we had a midwife, and the midwife had a husband. And the husband worked part time for Steve and ran the long distance uh, trash haul. And I got to know him because uh -huh. of his wife. And he was working at Flatiron, and he mentioned to Steve that he had met me and uh, heard some of the stories that uh, about my previous career as a yeah. builder in Southern California. And I guess he did his homework, and I was having uh, dinner at the home of my pastor at the time. Uh -huh. And a phone call came there, and it was uh, for me, and I thought that was kind of odd. <laughs> Took the call, and it was Steve, and he, he said, uh, uh, yeah, I'm Steve Carlson of uh, Flatiron Mandolin, uh, and I understand uh, uh, that you know you've done all this different work with uh, guitars and banjos and mandolins. And uh, uh, he said, I've checked you out, and uh, I'd like to come over here and uh, uh, go to work for me. And I said, Well, gee, gosh, I, I'm very flattered, you know. And I tried to relate the story of going in the store before, which you I was going to say, No, no, no. Yeah, so you we go remember from, that. So we go from, Yeah, great. See you later. Yeah. To, Hey, can you come work for me? And uh, the reason was there was a guy named Steve there that uh, was leaving, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he found it difficult to work over here, and uh, he wanted to go back to Kansas. So I came over for an interview and met Steve, and uh, um, he'd said on the phone, I mean, I was, I was running my gun shop, I was traveling with a church band, and I was building a lot of artifacts for Western artists at the time, so I was covered up pretty good. <laughs> time-wise, and uh, I was also working 40 hours a week for Sharps Arms, stocking guns. So <laughs> I had a lot going on, and, and, you know, back in the 80s, if you lived in Montana, you had to have four or five jobs, plus you had to have your wife work at a cafe somewhere, usually. Sure. And, <laughs> so um, he said, well, I'll pay $1,850, because I said, oh, I can't possibly consider it. Thank you very much, but I'm doing this. He said, well, I was going to pay 1850 a month. I said, I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove over, had my interview. We decided that uh, I could come to work for him. And uh, as it turned out, I, I lived with him for the first two years, off and on. I would work 
I'd get over here at 5 o'clock in the morning on a Monday, and I would leave at 8 or 9 o'clock on a Thursday night and have the weekends home and oh. stop traveling with the band and um, uh, some other stuff that I was doing. I, I left Sharps and yeah. uh, uh, I worked there through a contract period, and so that became my uh, my introduction to Bozeman, other than driving through when I moved here. Sure, sure. Um, and Steve and I became friends, and he is a uh, brilliant, tireless uh, visionary. And keeping up with him is difficult, but uh, but I mean, he really needs to get stuff done. So we crashed into the business. He had just started uh, to build carved arch tops. Okay. And. Uh, I'd had a lot of experience in the past, so it was sort of natural. He'd done some stuff I thought was very cool. He had automated a, basically a panograph slave carver where he could put a part in and it would come out rough, and uh, then we would hand tune him after that. Nice. And initially, uh, there was about seven employees. Wow. And, uh, and this is still a lot with Flatiron, correct? It's 1985. Okay, okay. Yeah, I came over in, uh, I think it was uh, June of 85 and started working for him. And within a year, we were up to building 12 card tops a week. And uh, I mean, it grew even more than that. Pretty soon we were doing 12 Fs a week. I mean, we were Whoa. building a lot of mandolins. And I did the binding, uh, he did the, the final uh, uh, contour shaping and, and tap tuning of tops and backs. Mm -hmm. I did all the painting and, and much of the coloring and Whoa. ran the spray booth. and. Um, kind of was a shepherd over the whole place while yeah. he did his other stuff. Well, we were very successful. So successful that we could outproduce what we could sell because Steve's limited method of sales had been based around making a half a dozen dozen flat mandolins a, sure. a week. And all of a sudden we had a lot of product to sell. So at the NAM show in 86, I believe, he went to uh, uh, down with his booth. I didn't travel with him, or if I did, maybe I stayed at the at the Flatiron booth. I don't even remember now. But he took a mandolin in the white, in the case with a brochure, and he went up and he said, "Well, you know, who's the owner of Gibson?" And everybody pointed at this tall blonde guy over here, young man. And he went over and he opened up the case. He took the mandolin out and he said, "I'm Steve Carlson of Flatiron Mandolin." And you guys build terrible mandolins, and we build the best in the world, and we'd like to be your OEM supplier. We can give you a better price and everything. And Henry took the mandolin and looked at it, and he goes, huh. Handed it back to him. He said, I think I'll just sue you and put you out of business. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve <laughs> grabbed the, the mandolin back out of his hand, threw it in the case, grabbed the brochure, and fled. And we did eventually get a cease and desist letter, which just crumpled us. Uh -huh. We folded. So we went obliquely and we started building banjos. And uh, as it would turn out, uh, Stan Jay of Mandolin Brothers was a big dealer of ours and a uh -huh. good friend of Henry's and yeah. sold a lot of Gibsons. And eventually he convinced Gibson or Henry to consider buying us because yeah. all of a sudden he wasn't selling six or eight carved mandolins a month anymore. He wasn't selling any. They weren't being produced. Right. So Henry... Uh, called Steve down, I think, right after the you know, the next uh, trade show, maybe in 87. And they struck a deal, uh -huh. and Gibson acquired Flatiron. And right about that time, Guild became available. And Henry had an opportunity to buy it, and somebody outbid him. And oh so he gosh. didn't get to buy it then. The idea was that when he bought it, um, he's a pretty sharp cat. Yeah. He realized right away that the Nashville business was where the Les Pauls were made. There was no reason to have acoustics on the floor. They were basically in the way. They weren't making anybody any money. They were costing the company square footage. So he removed everything off the floor, and there was no acoustic production happening after his purchase. Okay. Just shoved into trailers, get it off the floor. They expanded the Les Paul business, and it's history what he's done. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. just magical. So, but that left a void in the company, and uh, about that time, Guild Guitar came available and uh -huh. was put up for sale. And having thought he bought it, I guess uh, somebody else lowballed him and and uh, 
he ended up missing it. The reason he wanted to buy it is Guilds are basically copies of Gibsons. Guilds started in 53, uh -huh. and they patterned their guitars first after Epiphone and then after Gibson. Yeah. Um, up to and including the traditional dove wing head shape. I yeah. mean, that was on the early Guilds. And uh, so he thought, well, gosh, they've already got all the tools to do it. They're in business. They're building a lot of guitars. If I buy that, then I'll just move production of Gibson flat tops to that factory and we'll have them build them and everything will grow and I'll still be guild, building guilds and, yeah. and it would be good. But as it turns out, uh, he missed getting it by a dollar or a million or whatever <laughs> price. I have no idea what the price was. But we didn't get it and uh, um, there was need. I mean, there was so much going on with the, the electric end yeah. that the demand kept percolating like, Every dealer in the company country kept ordering a J200 or a Dove or a Hummingbird or a J45, yeah. and so on the books it looked like there was a bazillion back orders. Yeah. But it was one guy calling every store trying to find one, and they'd say, "Well, we better get one on order." So I mean, there were a lot of back orders, but there was a lot of uh, air in between all of that. It was the same guy often. Yeah. So uh, he wanted to get back in business, and Steve. Um, convinced him that I had had all this experience and I was this legendary luthier of the time that I uh -huh. could build his factory for him. And uh, so he decided, he talked him into letting me have a shot at building the guitars. And Steve at that time decided to be the contractor for the new factory here in, in uh, Montana, uh -huh. out on uh, uh, whatever, Orville Way. Uh -huh convinced the city to allow us to name the street Orville Way because we wanted to do it the old way, the old Orville Way. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so they let us change the name of the street, which uh -huh. was like Hangman's Noose or something. And uh, he started building the building and I went down uh, with him. We brought all the trailers, uh, took all the stuff off of, out of the trailers and yeah. packed it up and shipped it to Montana. And we are, uh, just put it up in a building in town and started to try and figure out the tools. Yeah. It wasn't intact, so we didn't really know what anything did. And it just didn't work. I mean, the stuff was broken or smashed or it didn't. So was it you know. basically like starting, I mean, when the stuff came up here and, and it was decided that acoustic guitar production for Gibson was going to be here, was it like starting over in a way? There was a lot of material. Yeah. I mean, they even had Brazilian they didn't know they had. Yeah. You know, I mean, they had a lot of stuff. Um, but the tools and the methods that they had been building were, um, I mean, the history of Gibson goes back, you know, into the 1800s, but every time it, it went through this metamorphosis um, and, and changed, new tooling, new people came in, they sure. all had ideas. And during the Norland area, the idea was take money out, you know, and uh, make things cheaper and you know, never have a guitar come back, so you make them stronger and thicker and really brace them. And I mean, they made some, what we would consider today, bad choices for the guitar, yeah. but they're businessmen, you know, they weren't sure. guitar players. And sure. so they didn't, they didn't have to have this energy going through their veins, they just wanted to go to the bank. Right, so right. they made changes that they thought were appropriate at the time. The, uh, the bottom line was the stuff that we got, we looked at and we go, I mean, I would always build guitars like they did back in the 30s or the 20s, sure, you know, sure. uh, because I learned, I taught myself how to build by taking old guitars apart and measuring and making templates. And, and so I knew from looking at old photographs and stuff how they used to be done. And that's what I did. Right. So I looked at all the stuff they had, and most of it was just clutter and, and junk to me because it was modern and aluminum. And the guitars that were being built on it, I didn't think were worth a darn. Uh -huh. So we cobbled together stuff. And we convinced him that we needed to go out and spend some more money. And when I say we, I mean Steve. Yeah. <laughs> and so Steve flew down to uh, Denver and bought $3,500 worth of used um, tennis racket making machinery. And he brought it up and I dismantled it all. And most of it was steel, logic control, bending arms and, uh, you know, for wrapping uh, tennis rackets. Sure. And, um, drilling machines and so we got all these automated air drills and logic controllers and uh, a lot of steel tables and a lot of aluminum. Uh -huh. And so we did get a J45 press 
and a J200 press and a Hummingbird press that had been in, uh, two of them had been in Kalamazoo. Okay. One of them probably was replicated and uh, built in Nashville. Uh -huh. We had those and we had the machine that we couldn't find any other way to do it was to cut the dovetail and it's still in use today. Um, and that's probably from the 30s or 40s. I mean, oh it's a God. transformer the size of this room <laughs> that runs it. <laughs> um, it's a pretty cool tool and uh, a lot of history on that. And other than that, the way they were doing things uh, were automated for the time, but they didn't produce the results that we wanted. So we just yeah. sort of went out in the backyard and got a couple of weed burners and a big old cast iron kettle and uh, made wooden molds and I'd melt the metal down and uh, the aluminum down and pour it into a sand mold and, and uh, cast up these parts and jig drill them and bolt them together and go to a shaper and we'd you know, finish parts that we could yeah. use to bend sides because we needed to build an L00, we needed to build a 185, we needed yeah. to build uh, an advanced jumbo, sure. you know, an L1. And so we made our own molds. I right. mean, we just you know, Hershey bar and a brick, and we were able to do it, you know. So we took some of the employees from Flatiron, and we brought the mandolin factory into our factory at the same time. Uh -huh. um, you had mentioned Bruce Weber. Yeah. Well, Bruce's wife worked for us as an accountant or accounts payable or, or something sure. at Flatiron. And we were having trouble canvassing the area here for people that we could get to work for us that had eye-hand coordination. And I was trying to explain to her she was going to place an ad. And uh, I said, I need somebody, a sculptor, you know, I need somebody that already doesn't have to think about learning, just has to do something different they haven't done. It. You know, someone like a potter. She goes, oh, my husband's a potter, Bruce. I'll have him come down and talk to you. So he did, uh -huh. and we hired him. And uh, he became my apprentice and Steve's apprentice. and. Uh, in the mandolin factory, and uh, he stayed with it and now has his own business. Yeah. So, wow. um, But we moved everything over, and we found that it was uh, really incongruent to try and have those two instruments built at the same place at the same time. Right. It was possible back in the teens and the 20s. Uh, we were trying to build things correctly, but automated. And yeah, mandolins yeah. can't quite keep up with that. Right. So if you spend 40 hours building an F5, you know, we wanted to spend 20 hours building a, uh, a flat top. Sure, sure. And we were probably at about 30 or 40, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't working. And the people that were building the guitars were frustrated with the people building the mandolins because they could take as long as they wanted to get them right. They had to get theirs right within this time. Right. So it eventually moved back into the old red building. In that period, and in building the factory itself, Steve was uh, inspecting the roof system and stepped off the roof onto a ladder and it slid. And he fell through the ladder and then fell to the ground on the concrete and cracked his head open, broke an arm, broke a terribly broke, I guess, his elbow and a oh uh, compound fracture of his leg where it went through and snapped on the thing. And I, you know, I mentioned how Steve is hard to keep up with, yeah. you know, a crowd gathered around immediately to see how bad he was injured. And his first words, are you guys on the clock? Get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Steve. You know? uh, uh -huh. So the ambulance came, took him away. And while he was convalescing, Henry moved him into a position. I think he was CFO of the company for a long time. Yeah. And I just continued running this up here. Yeah. And Dennis Ballion came in as, a, as the general manager, so yeah. I was the plant manager. And, designed all the tools and the fixtures and redid all the um, bracing patterns and wow. the way I like to do the stuff. Yeah. And, and they started to gain acceptance. And um, they were the best guitars that had been built by Gibson, you know, since the 40s anyways. Yeah. Other than a piece here and there that was real nice. Sure. So that career uh, took wings. And in 94, um, that was the anniversary of Gibson's 100 year anniversary. Right. Um, actually in 93 we built four custom guitars uh, that were not ordered by somebody. They were just stuff I dreamed up. Yeah. And uh, Robbie Johns, our marketing director, had come on board I think the end of 92, early 93. And uh, he and I decided that 
since the name of the Gibson was the King of the Flat Tops, that we needed to do something to really rock for our anniversary. Right, you know, right. The trade show. And, uh, and so we set about doing that. And that started a whole new uh, era of building there that uh, a lot of custom customization was going on. Yeah, yeah. The factory was working really well. We hit a, a real wobble between 94 and about mid-95. Um, there were uh, decisions made that were um, not in the best interest of longevity for an instrument yeah. made by the then current uh, GM. Uh, trying to maximize more dollars, but sure. not knowing what it took to build an instrument. So there were some physical changes um, th that cost us a lot. I yeah. mean, they, were, they were really a problem. And uh, we just got into a, a rhythm of problems that created other problems. And uh, yeah. eventually, uh, it was just falling apart. Yeah. And that guy was let go. and. Some salesman got Henry's attention and said, you know, we got to get these things fixed. And yeah. for some reason, I had irritated this guy or something, and he had uh, taken me out of running the factory and put me in the repair shop. Uh -huh. And uh, another fellow was a G uh, plant manager at that time. And he was a good guy, but he did, wasn't a guitar builder, and so he agreed with the changes that were being made. Sure. Not knowing the impact that, it was right, cause. Right, right. Um, I mean, it was simple, but it was catastrophic. Yeah. And uh, so the sales went down. They were having problems getting guitars out. And so Henry at that time came up and said, you know, you guys have got to get your act together. And what do you need to do this? And I said, well, we've expanded so quickly. And uh, he said, well, I want you to get a new guitar. And we said, OK, you know, come up with something new that, that was catchy. And, we fixed the problems, basically had the factory stop building all the variations, uh -huh. all the painted guitars, everything went back to natural. Um, you couldn't hide a blemish with paint. You know? right. And it was right. five models, and that was it. And they had to be perfect. And what they had been doing was anything would, would go through under the previous GM. And uh, they they got back to building really good guitars. Yeah. And while that rhythm was happening, uh, Robbie and I did a real extensive uh, uh, search of the industry to try and find out what people mm -hmm. wanted. And what was the common denominator on any given guitar that people were now expecting to see and buy? Much of it wasn't what Gibson had not really done. Right, right. And when I finally got up out of that, I had decided that I would finally retired because I wasn't getting to do what I wanted to right, do there anymore. Right. And I was going to get about the same amount of money for Social Security so yeah. I could build guitars if I wanted on the side. I mean, there just wasn't a future in what I had tried to lead the company up to as far as quality and, and ornamentation.